about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instructions in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity, to teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. Let the wise also hear and gain in learning, and the discerning acquire skill to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, David. This particular passage that was just read, of course, comes from the book of Proverbs. And the Proverbs was written almost a thousand years before Christ. Many believe that this book was written by King Solomon. And, or many scholars believe if it wasn't written by King Solomon, it was at least a collection of texts that were compiled together by King Solomon. Uh, it's a collection of writings that is known as uh, that are known as didactic uh, texts or moral teaching text, uh, basically teaching the people of Israel about wisdom and how wisdom can be practically applied to everyday life. Essentially, uh, this book is about how to live wisely. And uh, this teaching book about how to live wisely says only seven verses into the first chapter that the beginning of wisdom 
is fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, as may be opposed to living in the world. You see, what Proverbs is saying to us is that we uh, first must fear the Lord or we will have no understanding in this life. And what is understanding? What is wisdom? If you think about it, you can maybe say that they are awareness or a deep knowledge of something. So in those terms, if God is truth, you know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. Without truth and a fear or a healthy respect for truth, you could say, we will not be aware or have knowledge of the world around us. We will not be wise because we don't have God's truth as our foundation, our guide. So we must respect it. And maybe even have a little twinge of fear for it. A couple of years ago, I was doing a Bible study. I think it was here, and some of you may have been a part of that Bible study. We were just basically looking at the book of Psalms, and we were picking out some of our favorite Psalms, and we would start to study those Psalms verse by verse. verse. And during one of the days that I was in my office doing research on one of the psalms i'd happen to be doing psalm 19 and in that psalm there's this section that says this it says the law of the lord is perfect reviving the soul the decrees of the lord are sure making wise the simple the precepts of the lord are right rejoicing in the heart the fear of the lord is pure enduring forever the ordinances of the lord are true and righteous altogether More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and dripping of the honeycomb. So here in this passage, you have this stanza, which is obviously talking about scripture or or words of God, sayings, laws, decrees, precepts, ordinances, things written down from God, truth written down from God. And it says, These are more to be desired than gold, sweeter than honey. And then right in the middle of this group, added in, is this verse that says, Fear of the Lord is pure and enduring forever. And that stuck out to me, that fear of the Lord, because it didn't seem like it fit in that scripture, right? You know, one of these things just doesn't belong here. There are all of these descriptive words about God's truth, words that are written down from God, laws, ordinances, scriptures, and then right in the middle of that is this idea of fear of God mixed in. Like God's scripture is desired for, and it's good, and it's sweet. But there is also some fear in it too. Well, that got me thinking. You know, I never feared God's word. Why should I fear God's word? And so I began to dig a little deeper, and that led me to the wisdom literature and Proverbs and uh, actually this uh, opening chapter of Proverbs. And it hit me again right there in verse 7. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding, of wisdom. I never feared the Lord that way. It's been all grace and forgiveness and love. Why the fear? God is truth. God's word is truth given to us. And as our scripture for this morning says, that the fear of God of this truth giving to us is the beginning of wisdom. And through this study and some other conversations and studies that were going on at the time with me, I began to be confronted with the idea that maybe in my teaching and my preaching and in my ministry, that maybe my not possessing this fear of God. I mean, I had a respect for the scriptures. I had a reverence for, but not a bit of fear of God's truth. And maybe because of this, maybe it was proof that I wasn't as wise as I thought. At least that was my thinking. So after that, what I started to do is when I went to scripture, I I purposely tried to make a mental note of scripture that gave me a little twinge of fear when I read them. Many times the way we approach scripture, and this is only human, it's 
it's all of us do it this way, but when we don't understand something in Scripture, we, we easily disregard it. Or if it makes us uncomfortable, we easily disregard it. Or if it gives us fear, or it doesn't fit into our view that we like to view God as a lovable, forgiving, peace-filled, comforting God. If it doesn't fit into that, we easily what? We easily disregard it. So what I began to do was I began to purposely seek out scripture that gave me the feeling that maybe I should not disregard this scripture, right? And it was easy at first. The entire Old Testament is full of that stuff that you kind of fear. I mean, God destroys the whole wicked world and everyone in it, man, woman, and child, just eight chapters into the first book. Destroys the whole world, except for eight people. It wasn't hard to find scripture in the Old Testament that made me think, yeah, that scripture right there, that gives me some fear. It wasn't just the Old Testament, though, because generally we think that all the fearful stuff is in the Old Testament, but yeah, it was in the New Testament, too, maybe even more so, because it didn't talk about exterior people and events, but much of its fear of God came from scriptures that sort of shined a light on stuff that was in my own heart that I struggled with, like it was more personal, like Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount about things of the law that seem almost impossible to live up to, like loving enemies or turning other cheeks. And then there was these whole books that were devoted to punishment that happened to false prophets and leading people astray. It's like there's a special place in hell if you lead people astray. And as a pastor, I became more aware of those texts for obvious reasons, right? I feared those texts. Jesus in Matthew 18, 6, speaking about being a stumbling block for children to follow him, says this, If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believes in me, it would be better for you if you had a great millstone fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. These are Jesus' words. My goodness, what could be worse than that? Yeah, being a teacher and a pastor, yeah, that gave me a little fear when I read that scripture. I used to ride motorcycles a lot a few years ago. Uh, I'm giving it up because I'm getting old. But I was really into those fast plastic sport bikes for a few years. You know, those ones that are as light as a feather and fast as a rocket, you know, those kind of bikes. Uh, I had, at the time, a bike that could do 200 miles an hour. Now, I didn't ever do 200 miles an hour on that bike. You know why? Because I had a fear of it, right? I had a healthy fear of doing 200 miles an hour. Respect for it. Respect for something with a twinge of fear is really knowing where the line is, right? There's probably some wisdom in that, too. Like, the line could be 150, but not 200, (laughs) right? Just joking, Michelle. <laughs> or you could think of it this way. I had a wonderful father. I loved him, and he, he loved me. Never, never, never had anything but love for me. But I held a healthy fear of him, too, you know, because I knew where the line was with him. If I went over the line, there would be consequences, right? There would be punishment, right? I knew what the rules were, and if I broke them, there would be consequences. Scripture, God's word, God's truth are rules. They are showing us where the lines are. And because there are consequences, if we break them or we go over the line, we should possess a twinge of fear of them. Knowing where the lines are, A little bit of fear of God's truth is wisdom. It's just being smart. You know, God's lines, too, are unmovable. We just don't disregard them because we don't like them. 2 Peter 1, verse 20. This is Peter writing this. Right before this verse, Peter's talking about I saw Jesus transfigured. I saw what he was on that mountain. 
transfigured before me. I heard the word of God come down. You would do good if you listened to this. And then he says this, first of all, what you must understand is this, is that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, meaning no piece of Scripture is a matter of one's own opinion. It's not subjective. It's an objective truth coming from beyond us. And then he continues, because no prophecy ever came from human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, meaning none of this, any of this, of any of it, came from us. It all came from God to us. And now, when I read that, I begin to get really scared. And fear comes to me. Because it doesn't take me long to start thinking about how Maybe we as churches and leaders from time to time have been moving the lines a bit. Maybe making up the rules. Or as another real scary scripture from Jude, Jesus' half-brother would say, perverting the grace of God and turning it into licentiousness. Taking God's grace towards us and using it as a free pass to do anything or affirm any behavior. Hey, we're saved. God forgives us. Let's do whatever we want. Actually, if it is what I want and God made me that way, maybe it isn't even a sin at all. Plus, it's mean to speak a lot of God's truth to people, and it also can scare you from time to time. Fear. Jesus did say millstone, right? want to make sure. When my wife and I were on vacation, we drove by a a church in Maryland that was draped in a huge rainbow-colored flag for the LGBTQIA community, and under one of the flags was the sign that says, we are a welcoming congregation, like LGBTQ people, you are welcome here, right? And I said to my wife, you know, that kind of offends me in some way, because Do I have to drape the church in one of these flags to be welcoming? No, because we've always been welcoming to everyone in the church. And every one of the churches that I've ever served, including New Brighton, has been welcoming. We are all created in the image of God, and we're all welcome here. And we bring all of our baggage and our sin and anything else with it, and we lay it at the feet of Jesus. We are welcome, and we accept all. But no, what they're saying with that is not that they are welcoming and accepting, but they are affirming too. Affirming of anything that you want to do. And there's the problem. That's what I'm talking about with maybe we're moving the line a bit. I can be welcoming, I can be accepting, but I cannot be affirming of everything, including sin in my my own life that I need to work on. I can't affirm everything is not sin just so that I feel welcome or accepted. For example, can a man have a baby? We all know that biologically a man cannot have a baby. We cannot affirm the lie of a man having a baby. If we affirm that in the churches... We allow a great deceiver into the church, a liar. And who is the great deceiver? We as churches need to reach for a greater ideal that says the great deceiver, the devil, is not allowed. Because that line is immovable. The rule is set. And it's not my rule open to my interpretation, as Peter says. But it is a loving rule. Because it protects us from the consequences. You love your child enough to smack their hand away from a hot stove. You know why? Because you don't want to see them burn. You love them too much. That's love too. Wisdom cries out in the streets. In the squares she raises her voice at the busiest corner she cries out 
At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffering, and scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because, you, because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded, and because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. And I will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own ways and be sated with their own devices. For waywardness kills the simple And the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread of disaster. Wisdom. Truth of God. Jesus did say millstone. Right? So now you know. Glory be to the Lord our God. Jesus the Christ. Thank you.